Okay, well, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us tonight. I hope wherever you are is a little bit warmer and a little bit less rainy than Crawfordsville. Um, but you know, that's December in Indiana, never know what you're gonna get. Um, so my name is Emily Vetney and I work at Wabash in our Office for College Advancement. And I am delighted to welcome Professor Derek Nelson to speak with us tonight. He is a theologian on faculty here, a professor of religion and the Stephen Bowen Professor of the Liberal Arts. He has been at Wabash sort of two times in his life. He is class of 1999 and has been on our faculty since 2012 and holds degrees from Yale and from Berkeley. So welcome, Professor Nelson. We are so happy to have you. Thank you. It's an honor to be asked. Can everybody hear me okay? Sounds good. Okay. I'm not going to get any better looking, but I might get better sounding if you tell me that I you can't hear. Um, I'm pleased to be asked to talk about a, a, a project that's underway that I want to tell you about. And hopefully I can. There we go. The project is going to be a challenge to, um, to discuss uh, because it's a summary of a book that's not written yet. And it's also uh, getting bigger and bigger and more complicated. So I'm going to try to hit some highlights uh, and get a lot of things on the table. I'm not going to tie a lot of loose ends up. Uh, so I'll leave that uh, to the question and answer for the connection drawing. But uh, the project is basically a contribution to eco-theology and environmental ethics. But it's also a, it's a reflection on ecological home design. Uh, I'm a person who's interested in furniture making and, uh, and construction and green homes. And I've been concerned that uh, some of the techniques that we're using and some of the approaches that we're um, launching from in green home design are actually just kind of um, contributing to the problem as I see it, which is uh, estrangement from the natural world. And this is also an invitation to some new, um, actually kind of old ways, but refreshing, hopefully, ways of reading some biblical texts. So um, why am I interested in this project of uh, thinking about the concept of home as a way to approach the, um, the climate crisis? Uh, I think the environmental humanities have a contribution to make to what I call the uh, the poly crisis. Poly crisis is a, a multifaceted system where um, attempts to solve one aspect of the problem are thwarted if you don't also uh, attend to the parallel and complicating factors of uh, of related crises. So I think you know we have three that are happening right now. We have global climate change and all of the devastation that it's wreaking, but we also have the lingering effects of structural inequality and racism that mean that the effects of the um, climate change are not equally shared and resources for, uh, for um, attending to the problems that, they're, that, that are caused are not equally available. And then we also have uh, a, a kind of growing unresponsiveness of governmental systems uh, to organize collective action to fix the first two. <laughs> and so as one gets worse, the other two get worse. And as they get worse, the other gets worse. Uh, and so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to be kind of a bummer outer here for a while. Um, I'm also interested in the ways that this... Um, um, environmental humanities helps us think about um, problems like, um, well, let's say uh, uh, radical life enhancement, this idea that um, life expectancy could uh, double or more in the next decades, or um, things like exoskeletons and cyborg suits. Uh, there's a kind of a contribution that um, theology, I think, can make to like the affirmation of basic good, the basic goodness of human nature. So I taught a very interesting class at Wabash a couple of years ago on kind of the incarnation and the goodness of uh, the human being, even with its limitations, even with its mortality, even with its uh, um, uh, senescence and, uh, and so forth. Uh, so the environmental humanities, especially eco-theology says that this thing that we're sitting around in is creation. It's not merely cosmos. That's already a major statement about dependence and fragility uh, and destiny. I also think that the usual motives for working toward climate justice uh, are two, and they're inadequate. Uh, they're either guilt and shame or enlightened self-interest. 
I'll pick on my wife a little bit. Don't, if you guys know Kelly, don't uh, don't give her too hard a time. But you know, it viscerally hurts her if she can't recycle her Coke can. Uh, she has been uh, sort of you know um, uh, acculturated to this idea that you are a bad person if you do this harmful thing to the environment. And I am perfectly okay with using guilt and shame to uh, direct action toward uh, just ends, but. I think it's going to be inadequate in reorienting our whole selves the way that we're going to have to to solve climate change. There also, you know, I don't lose too much sleep at night. Uh, I have a one-year-old baby who sleeps like a log, so I'm lucky there. If I do, uh, I'm worried that all there is at the end of the day is enlightened self-interest. The best we can hope for is that people work uh, in a relatively sophisticated way uh, for their own good that raises the good for all. Uh, so these are the kinds of arguments you usually see being made for uh, a, a, an adjustment for um, uh, for for climate, and they're just going to be inadequate. I think with Wendell Berry, who's kind of my favorite uh, thinker these days, writer these days, to whom I go for comfort and, and inspiration, it all hinges on affection. If you don't have a kind of love for uh, willingness to fight for that which you love, we're not going to we're not going to get anywhere. Lastly, uh, the reason I'm uh, interested in this project, I think, is uh, focus on public policies and and these faraway things like regulation of commerce and kind of uh, political decisions being made at the at the highest levels distracts from uh, ways that individual people can act in a very concrete way close to home. So that's why I keep coming back to this idea of of home. Um, here's kind of a fun project that we did in uh, Religion 270 last month. Uh, you see on the, the bottom middle is a reconstruction of Thoreau's cabin at Walden. Uh, Thoreau was responding to uh, um, similar crises in his day uh, on, the, on the eve of the uh, Civil War uh, and the estrangements that were happening from the first um, Industrial Revolution, as well as um, uh, some, some issues with, uh, with fertility, with, with, with the, the food system. So uh, it's kind of the, the same three prongs of our, our poly crisis 150 years ago. I thought it'd be fun if we tried this out. So as a class, we built a replica of uh, Thoreau's cabin, uh, which was an awful lot of fun. I found a measured drawing and we, we actually did this, uh, which was a, a great success. We can talk about that in the questions if you want. Uh, so I'll talk about two historical trajectories here. One's an old one, uh, has to do with Gnosticism and the church's response to it. So we're talking here like 100 to 350. AD. And then uh, I've been very influenced by some recent theorists on the way that technological acceleration is uh, is uh, contributing to the estrangements that I think go with climate change. So uh, what I hope to convince you of is that these two uh, trajectories are kind of running parallel. And so the response that was successful in the first one might be successful in the second one. Uh, we'll see if I persuade you of that. Uh, so first, a bit about Gnosticism. Uh, Gnosticism was an anti-materialist philosophy uh, from about, uh, oh, maybe ab about the year one to about the year 300. And it's essentially the refusal to live within the limitations imposed by the material world. Um, Gnosticism is a, it's a, a, a school of thought that I would say falsely implies that human beings can transcend the materially imposed limits uh, of, of the world, that the earth is not really our home and that material goods uh, should be kind of shunned or, uh, or ignored. Um, a good way to see all of these is in one Gnostic text, and there's uh, thousands we could choose from, but the hymn of the pearl is kind of short. It's about a boy who feels like he doesn't belong in Egypt. Uh, the food and the clothing and uh, the, the physicality of his uh, surroundings, they get in the way of his thinking. He can't escape to his true homeland, uh, except if he's taught by certain uh, mental exercises, if he learns wisdom, and the, the, the Greek word for wisdom is or knowing is gnosis. So this is a, a, a kind of attractive school of thought to people. Uh, lots of kids, I know I did when I was, when I was uh, 10 years old, I just assumed that I couldn't possibly be the child of my parents. There's no way. Uh, I must be, you know, adopted because they are so crazy. And I know that I am so great that I could not possibly have come from such thought. This kind of like, I don't belong here. Uh, it, it's, a, it's almost a universal 
feeling, I think. And so Gnosticism gives people who have that sense that something is not right in their world and it's not their fault. It gives them a way to, to, um, to think that through. So we're going to go to the, uh, the hymn of the pearl here. And I'm having trouble seeing the right hand of my screen because uh, I have your lovely faces right there. So I'm going to see what I can do to see the right hand part of the screen. Okay, there we go. Um, can you still see the screen, everybody? All right. Yeah, okay. thanks. So we read, and I've, I've excerpted this cut a lot out. If you go down to Egypt and bring the one pearl, which is in the midst of the sea, in the abode of the loud breathing serpent, you shall put on again your splendid robe, and with your brother, our next in rank, you will be heir in our kingdom. That's coming from the uh, the parents. This uh, this the story is about this boy who's supposed to bring back the one pearl, and the one pearl is sort of uh, is wisdom, is teaching. So then the the in the stuff that's omitted, the boy goes off to Egypt in disguise, but the Egyptians they see him as some kind of strange foreigner. And then the the boy says, but from some cause or other, they perceived that I was not their countryman, and they dealt with me treacherously and gave me to eat of their food. And I forgot that I was a king's son, and I served their king, and I forgot the pearl for which my parents had sent me. And because of the heaviness of their food, I fell into a deep sleep. So here we see that, you know, this, uh, the physical stuff around you, the, the, the materiality of the world is what the problem is. His clothes are wrong, the food stinks, uh, it's, it's heavy. The, the word heaviness there has, has to do with materiality, uh, actually. So back home, his parents hear the bad news, and they send this magic letter that, like, wakes the boy up from his sleep. And then the boy continues, I remember that I was a son of kings, and my noble birth asserted itself. And I snatched away the pearl, and I turned about to go to, go, uh, to my father's house. And their dirty and unclean garment I took off and left in their land. And it directed my way that I might come to the light of our homeland, the East. So in the, the bolded parts there, you see this uh, early church. Uh, well, early, some Christians were Gnostics and, and, and vice versa. But basically, this is a challenge to Christianity. Christianity emerging from Judaism. The world is good. Uh, and behold, the world is very good. It's an it's a, uh, earthy, uh, materiality-affirming kind of... Um, of uh, religion, and so you know this is this is rejected by by the early church. And the way that it is rejected, uh, this is I'm not saying this is totally new. Like uh, Nelson saw this, and no one else did. But if you if you look at how many early Christian texts talk about no the the world, the earth, and materiality in it is uh, is the home it's higher than you think it's higher than is usually thought so athanasius is a great example he's a 4th century uh, theologian he writes this famous book on the incarnation of the word in 335 so here's a quotation now in truth this great work the incarnation was peculiarly suited to god's goodness for if a king having founded a house or city of dwellings if it be beset by bandits from the carelessness of its residents, i.e. that's like sin, does not simply neglect it, but avenges and reclaims it as his own, having regard not to the carelessness of the inhabitants, but to what beseems himself. Much more did God, the word of the all-good Father, not neglect the whole of humanity. This is uh, God becomes one of the residents of this earthly dwelling. Uh, because it's it's good, but it's been uh, harmed by bandits, and so God uh, goes out of God's way to um, take His place among them. Uh, or another example, just as uh, from the same same book, different chapter, just as when a great emperor has entered into some large city and dwelt in one of its houses, such city and home is naturally deemed worthy of much honor, and no enemy or bandit any longer descends upon it to overthrow it but rather it is deemed worthy of all respect because of the emperor dwelling in one house there. So too it is, is it with the monarch of all for having come into our region and dwelt in one body amongst his peers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, the, the uh, George Washington slept here approach to, uh, to architecture. It's uh, venerated, it's ennobled and, and, and made better 
by the presence uh, in it of, of, a, of a great person. I just came back from uh, Washington, D or, sorry, Baltimore, uh, just an hour ago, uh, and uh, was at the Catholic seminary there, St. Mary's, and I uh, walked past a, a pew in their chapel, and there's a, literally a plaque that said, this is where John Paul II sat when he was here on, uh, you know, for like half an hour in, in 1998 or something. So uh, that's kind of Athanasius's reasoning behind this. Uh, I could pick a lot more uh, patristic sources. Here's a, a really good one from Irenaeus of Lyon. Uh, he says that the glory of God is the human being truly alive, and the life of the human being is the vision of God. Now, Irenaeus has a kind of notion and teaching about heaven, but you know what this is, that, that uh, the human being um, as such um, in ordinary places is the glory of God. True, that's, that's true life. This is not a place to be escaped. Uh, heaven is not a place to be sought at the expense of earth, uh, but earth itself is, is good. So this way of thinking um, got me uh, interested in going back to the Bible. And um, some some places where home pops up that are, I think, um, kind of interesting. Often, if some if someone talks about home in the Bible, it's homeland. It's uh, very much tied to the promised land and political stuff uh, that ends up, you know, having a very long after uh, after story later. Uh, but these are these are different. So, for example, some of you may know the the Old Testament, um, the what Christians call the Old Testament. The first uh, five books are largely written by four uh, sources, J, E, D, and P, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave out the explanation of those. The P is the priestly account, and it's the one that's very interested in, in the, the temple and its rituals. But it's uh, actually the, the first creation account in Genesis comes from P, and then uh, we skip back to J, and then P picks up. I sort of assume that the priestly source of creation kind of petered out at some point uh, in Genesis when actually uh, the E kind of takes over a lot and uh, the D means Deuteronomus, so that's mostly Deuteronomy. But anyway, um, I, I learned that the priestly account of creation extends all the way to Exodus 40. And what that means is that the creation account isn't done until the tabernacle has been made, until the place where God would be if God were anywhere is is created. The tabernacle is this tent um, uh, where uh, Israel worships God in in the wilderness. And so, you know, I just thought that was really fascinating that that the creation isn't done until God's house is built, so to speak. And then the same theme in the second one picks up uh, in the in the Christmas story in in the Gospel of John. The same word. Uh, in the Greek version of the Hebrew Bible uh, called the Septuagint is, uh, is used of Jesus. So in John 1, I think it's verse 12, and the word was made flesh, sarx, not uh, soma, body, but sarx is really, it's fleshy. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's very material heavy. And dwelled among us, uh, a skenosen, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of a father's only begotten son, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, glory is a topic that I've been thinking a lot about too, and writing some on Gl glory. We think of glory as being kind of ephemeral, maybe like a Bruce Springsteen, you know, fleeting moment. You know, back when my body didn't feel so bad, back when I was at Wabash and uh, twenty years old in my prime. You know, that's this fleetingness is glory. But in the Bible, glory um, in Hebrew is, is chavod, uh, which means heft, uh, the glorious uh, uh, throne uh, or or or, or um, crown is the one that's hefty, that's got a lot of uh, materiality to it. So here again, uh, there's there's something about being at home and an affirmation of the ordinary material world. To stay in John, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there about abiding, about dwelling with God. Abide uh, comes from our word abode, or they're related at least. And then this fascinating passage in Revelation, uh, if, if anywhere you'd expect to hear kingdom language about the, the metaphor for explaining God's presence on earth, and the dominant New Testament image is definitely kingdom. There's no doubt about that. I'm not, I'm not uh, suggesting otherwise. Uh, but I think considering the earth as the home of God is a really 
uh, useful addition to that. If there's anywhere you'd expect in the Bible to hear kingdom language, it'd be from the throne in Revelation. But instead, what we hear there is, behold, the home of God is among mortals, not the kingdom, which I just find interesting. So um, this uh, this return to the biblical texts, uh, looking for different things uh, and finding different things happens. So to sum up this kind of old trajectory, Gnosticism told you that you were alienated or estranged from your body, from your physical surroundings or your dwelling place and your community. Or, you know, if you don't want to say it that strongly, in some ways it spoke to people who had undergone those kinds of estrangements, those who felt they didn't belong, didn't belong in their body. Um, uh, and it's it may be easier to say that you don't belong in your body when everyone's dying of the plague and measles at 23. Um, but they were pleased to have an uh, explanation for it. So Gnosticism spoke to this really widespread, widespread um, problem. And the early church found ways of describing being at home in your body, in your dwelling, and in your community. So let's jump forward to this, um, this new historical trajectory. And uh, I hope there aren't any actual historians on the call, because I'm going to do a terrible job of just grossly oversimplifying some really complicated things. Um, but the, the, the top point here on this slide is what I, what I really th captures my imagination. Uh, our relationship to the physical world, which I hope there's at least some connection between that and the environmental crisis, right? Um, I think a, a fascinating datum is that the average household in, in 1700 had less than 100 items, fewer than 100 items, maybe 60 to 90 in the year 2000, there were 300,000 items in our in the average household. And that's just kind of amazing. Uh, and, and just as the, the, the frog who's thrown into hot water jumps out, the, the, the frog who's put in cold water boils uh, because it happens so um, um, in, a, in a difficult to, to tell kind of way. Historians of technology uh, have described several industrial revolutions. Uh, the first one uh, is maybe the one we're most used to uh, hearing. That, that's mechanization and uh, specialized, uh, you know, assembly line kind of um, uh, uh, production. Um, but the second industrial revolution is quite different. That's uh, electrified mass production in around 1900 changes uh, quite significantly. Um, then there's the digital revolution in uh, uh, around 1980 with computing. Uh, and the fourth one that we're in now uh, maybe is kind of a, a fusion of technologies. It's blurring the lines between the physical and the digital and the biological spheres. So this is some of the things like, uh, like the cyborgs and the exoskeletons and autonomous vehicles and 3D printing, AI, robotics, nanotech. Uh, the Internet of Things, which is a fascinating idea, quantum computing, and so forth. I think um, we're still teasing this out and still understanding what this uh, new industrial revolution exactly um, is going to, to lead to. But already the, um, the effects of this accrual of, uh, of um changes in technology, I think, are are evident. And here, my, my favorite thinker is a German sociologist and philosopher named Hartmut Wolsa. And if I do nothing else in this talk, I, I hope I persuade some of you to read uh, Rosa. I just think he's so interesting, and I think he's he's really spot on. His best book, or his, his the, the book I'd recommend is actually not on the, the screen now. It's called The Uncontrollability of the World. But Rosa's essential uh, thesis is that what we're seeing in modernity is acceleration. Acceleration is happening, and it's happening in lots of ways. You can see the the, the time frame on these uh, revolutions gets smaller and smaller, right? The first one's 150 years, the second one's 80 years, the second, the third one's 20 years, and and the the fourth one's just happening like this. But uh, you know, the the iPhone 14 is already obsolete by the time it arrives from uh, from the magical Amazon delivery system. Um, the number of jobs that people are going through is uh, is increasing at a, at a really high rate. It's why I think Wabash is on such a great uh, a great thing with its ac uh, academic approach training someone for for a, a variety of, of, of changing job realities. But you know 
there was a guy I, I knew a, a guy growing up in Minnesota and and he prided himself on being the best television repairman out there. Uh, and at a certain point, people just stopped repairing TVs. A, a television became an, a, a, a disposable item. And so he had to rethink his job and, and have to rethink his job again and again. And the effects of this mean that the amount of time with which we can identify with ourselves gets shorter and shorter. Our um, The changes that happen in our lives used to be you know, generationally, and then they became intragenerationally, and, then, and now they're even shorter than that. So our subjectivity, our, our ability to identify with ourselves and to, to see ourselves in the way we relate to the world gets attenuated. Um, Rosa talks often about, you know, this, uh, this, this uh, shrinking of the horizon of time. If I were to apply that to materiality, I think, um, you know, everything is becoming sort of single use and disposable. I uh, had so, some wonderful students over for dinner, uh, maybe in month 10 of the pandemic or something. And I, uh, they were doing a great job in class and I wanted to reward them with a, with a great meal. And so I uh, cooked this meal, had them over. Uh, and I was fishing for compliments. And I was like, hey, do you guys like uh, you guys like the food? And they kind of nodded their head. And one said, well, the nice thing is that I haven't used a, a metal fork in like six months uh, because we had to go to disposable stuff at Sparks. Um, that's happening in all kinds of ways. Uh, disposability is um, is really the, the watchword behind, I think, the environmental um, crisis. We're also... You know, I'm just going to make a real blunt point here. People are not feeling at home in their bodies. They're not feeling at home in their dwellings and they're, they're not feeling at home in their communities. To go in maybe reverse order, you know, statelessness and forced migration is one of the defining features of the current day. The United States military issued a uh, report in 2017 saying that uh, climate change was the most significant security threat facing the United States. Uh, because of uh, insecure food sources and droughts, and it's going to cause all kinds of uh, of migrations, which is going to lead to uh, conflicts. Uh, and so this is not something that we can ignore. Um, I need more time to do a good job explaining how I think uh, people aren't feeling at home in their bodies or their dwellings, but I'll get a few things on the table. Um, Painkillers. I, I was uh, talking with a, a good friend who's a professor of medicine about the opi opioid epidemic. And he pointed to a very interesting history behind it. He, he noted that around 1980 or so, the, um, I forget the name of the diagnostic uh, handbook, added a, a, an additional vital sign. In addition to uh, respiration, blood pressure, basal body temperature, et cetera, pain level, you know, on a scale of zero or one to 10 becomes a vital sign. Uh, as though, you know, as such, the presence of pain in one's body is is a problem, and now I, I don't wish chronic pain on anybody uh, at all. But this this idea that I'm me, uh, I'm this mind, and unfortunately I have this body that has this pain in the ass thing called pain. It's it's a strange idea. The New York Times uh, had an article about a, a different cultures relation to to pain level. It was a woman who was undergoing a hysterectomy in in uh, Germany, but she was uh, American, and she noted in her her post-treatment uh, uh, schedule that she was going to be prescribed um, ibuprofen after a, a, a hysterectomy. And she said, hey, my friends back in the US, they get the good stuff. Why am I getting ibuprofen? And the doctor said, it's a very interesting thing. Uh, he said, it's important that you hurt. Your body will help you. And I think that's just obviously true. If your body hurts a little bit, then you won't do something dumb, like get up on a ladder and clean the gutters after you just had a major surgery. Um, if you think back to the, to the um, notion of, of, of Gnosticism saying that the limits imposed by the material world are sort of false and you can transcend them, you know, um, there's something to, to be said there uh, between the, the, the present tension between sexuality and gender, that, um, that this is something that one can simply decide to, to ignore a kind of uh, constraint imposed from without. There's also a, a new uh, syndrome that's been uh, uh, discussed recently. It's called the uh, hypoplasticity, hypoplasticity dyspraxia. And it's the children of essentially uh, wealthy Westerners 
whose uh, um, fine motor skills don't develop because they're swiping left and right on devices instead of playing with physical blocks. So there's, there's a lot behind this, and I'm, I'm doing a poor, a poor job, I realize that, explaining all this, but the, the kind of estrangement of oneself from oneself um, is, is a kind of fascinating parallel to what the, the early Gnostics were saying. To then go to the, to the estrangement from dwellings, uh, there's a whole history of the um, history of construction that I'm kind of leaving out here. But uh, whereas in 1700, 1800, uh, a, a home was built to last as long as humanly possible, uh, you know, hundreds of years, ideally, uh, as westward expansion happened in the U.S., we needed new ways of building, uh, which then had new codes enforcing those ways of building that are essentially um, I don't want to say single use disposable, but using two by four studs and using, um, you know, sort of tar paper and asphalt shingles. This is an intentionally uh, shrinking uh, life of our buildings that's gotten uh, shorter and shorter as a uh, half inch plywood is now barely three eighths of an inch and a two by four, which has never been two inches by four inches is even smaller. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm getting a lot of things on the table here. Uh, I hope that some of them can kind of be um, uh, drawn together uh, when I talk about uh, the actual object lesson of the home that I built. Um, but to sum up some of my uh, theological uh, uh, stuff here, I mentioned uh, glory and chavod. Uh, I, I do want to get away from exclusively kingdom language for a variety of reasons. I also would like theology to move in some directions different from those that I was uh, kind of reared in, the school of Bart. Um, Bart was uh, the, the greatest theologian of the 20th century, a Swiss Swiss thinker who fled uh, the Nazis. He disliked the way that uh, Nazis had, uh, and theologians sympathetic with the, with the National Socialists, had really bastardized the view of creation to be kind of like the fatherland, the sort of generic, uh, uh, vague God, purple blob in the sky. Um, and so Bart's theology is always uh, extremely narrowly Christocentric. Uh, and that's the kind of the school of thought that I was raised in. I love this line from, from Peter Berger, though. He said, in a world full of Nazis, one may be forgiven for being a Bardian. Um, so my engagement with, uh, with Scandinavian creation theology, uh, which is uh, never had that problem, never had uh, this uh, bastardization of the notion of creation, that, that wants to try to find um, uh, universally shared themes, uh, or at least broadly shared themes, not focusing on kind of the, the narrow um, uh, Christological stuff. So I'm proposing that we can see uh, home in three ways, as belonging, as comfort, and as delight. Belonging, comfort, and delight. Belonging is like koinonia, this uh, sharing, uh, this, uh, this sense that, that I uh, am supposed to be here. Uh, comfort is uh, from the Latin word confortare, means to be strengthened. Uh, when you feel at home, uh, home is a place that you uh, to go for, for rest and rejuvenation to then go out and do something. You're strengthened for extending yourself into the world. And then uh, delight as grace. I'll omit some of that, um, uh, especially the grace stuff, because I think that's that's where I want to pick up on the, on the Hartman Rosa. So uh, some of you maybe saw the video that went out with the advertisement to, for this. Um, uh, two chapters of the book are going to be sort of how this all comes together in one house, one little house. So this is a little house that I built uh, basically out of boredom on my uh, pandemic time. Uh, I've always wanted to build a timber frame. I saw Norm Abram build one on this old house when I was uh, 18 and waited for the chance to do so. Um, so uh, I had some goals. I had a budget of twenty five thousand um, dollars. I wanted the, the house to be 500 square feet or more, so not a tiny house. I wanted it to be completely non-disposable, which means it has to be easy to disassemble and uh, not use plastics, at least as little as possible. It can be upcycled or reconfigured, taken apart and moved. I wanted it to last for 250 years, so longer than the average, much longer than the average uh, uh, home is, uh, is built to last now. And I wanted it to be some kind of mix of beautiful and functional. Uh, it ended up costing 30000 because um, I hadn't planned on having a deck, but I did want a deck on there. And my wife wouldn't let me plummet myself. So I had to pay someone to do that, which 
probably is a good idea. Uh, I did watch the YouTube video several times. I figured how hard can it be, but uh, she was probably right. I made all the furnishings myself uh, as well, and I don't count that in the cost of the of the cabin. Uh, and so, you know, I, I'm pleased to say that I um, met my goals, uh, exceeded them actually, and I think that the house itself tells a kind of interesting uh, theological story. I'm also pleased that some Emmy award-winning filmmakers wanted to come out and tell that story. So I'll pitch it over to uh, Emily now to show about five minutes or so uh, about how I think this sort of ties things together. Emily, over to you for the film. Sounds good. Thanks, Professor. All right, I'm going to stop your screen sharing and open up my share sound. Yes. All righty. There are lots of ways to frame a house. Stick frame, timber frame, straw bale, concrete block. And there are lots of ways conceptually to frame what it means to have a home. I guess at its heart, the evergreen was a chance for me to put those two together. The timber frame of a house and the theological frame of a home. My name is Derek Nelson, and I'm a professor of religion and liberal arts at Wabash College in Crawfordsville, Indiana. I live in the woods along Sugar Creek and over the past few years, I've been building and furnishing the Evergreen, a traditional timber frame structure, as an experiment in sustainable home construction and domestic life. Early America had timber frames mostly. That means large wooden posts and beams with precision cut joinery attaching the pieces together. It's beautiful. And these timbers are trapped carbon, if you think about it. They grow nearby, not much diesel to deliver them. You use some basic geometry to lay out mortises in the posts, beams, and plates, and cut tenons on the braces. It's an old technology, a far cry from, say, 3D printing your house, but it works. You cut the timbers when they're green, still a bit wet, and the dowels you drive through them are made from kiln-dried wood. The green timber will shrink as it dries, and the dowels will expand as they take on a little moisture. Every year then, these joints get tighter and stronger. On the other hand, if you stick frame, nailing together studs like most houses today, every year the studs expand and contract around the nails and everything gets looser and looser. Another difference is how the frame is made. It's just kind of there for you to see. Nothing's hidden. It's compelling. The scientist E.O. Wilson calls this biophilia the innate attraction humans have for more life, more abundance, more connection. We're drawn to it. The Evergreen's floor is made of ash because it's hard and stable, perfect flooring. Plus, every ash tree around is likely to die in the next few years because of a beetle, the emerald ash borer. So let's make the most of it. Most people buy flooring in set identical widths, except God doesn't make identical trees. This floor has random widths, some two inches, some two and a half, some three, some three and a half. So there's almost no waste and less cost. And also the palpable sense that this floor was once a tree. So the frame, the floor, and then the walls. In a stick framed house, you have a stud about every 16 inches. It breaks up the insulation. So you lose heat or let heat in. But in a timber-framed house like the Evergreen, no studs get in the way. It's amazingly efficient. And then there's the sill, the bottom of the frame, what the whole house is sitting on. It's made of white oak, the grandest wood in the Americas. It won't rot for centuries as long as it can dry out. It's so dense, bugs don't even bother trying to bore into it. The rest of the frame is poplar. They grow great here, strong, tall, and straight. It'll last half as long as oak, so probably 250 years, as long as it can dry out and stays painted. I think it's important spiritually not to build something that's only gonna last for your own lifetime, or even merely through the lives of your children. Better to take the long view, your grandkids' kids, built to last, no single use, as little plastic or disposable stuff as possible.
question is so simple and so elusive. What does it mean to have a home? Everyone, or almost everyone, knows, but no one can quite say. It's got to do with belonging, which is social, and being comfortable, which is physical. The word comfortable comes from the Latin word confortare, meaning to strengthen. I can rest when I'm at home. I can restore my strength so that I can do things, extend myself into the world, use my power and gifts. A home is a place to leave, as well as a place to stay. Homes are reflections of us, of what we value and cherish, of who we are. The average American house has 300,000 items. It increases in weight by 700 pounds a year. It's mind-boggling. There are 2.5 billion square feet of storage rental space in this country, a $38 billion industry that's one of the fastest growing in the nation. If our homes reflect our cherished values, what do you conclude? Why do we surround ourselves with mountains of plastic and then worry ourselves into finally throwing it away? I think there's a kind of sickness there. We need healing. Whether it's Marie Kondo or That's Swedish. Um, Perfect. Um, so I had just one more slide to show uh, about that. Um, just to follow up on some of those details. You can just see, the, so this is how a timber frame goes together. There's no uh, metal fasteners in the whole darn thing. Uh, it goes together through um, this uh, joinery, which makes it uh, uh, possible to take apart. These are these the SIPS panels. Uh, I just made a, a, a hand drawing of how big I wanted them and where I wanted the electrical uh, outlets to be, where I wanted the conduit to be, basically, uh, where the doors and windows were going to be, and they were delivered to my house. And you can see the, the half-inch OSB on the front and the back means that it has continuous insulation. You can also have plumbing in these. They're, they're kind of amazing. They're like 1990s technology that never really caught on for, for reasons that I don't, I don't really understand. But that means that the, that the house is extremely energy efficient. Um, uh, and mine happens to be uh, heated by wood, but I have the, the kind of high efficiency uh, wood burner that means uh, all the smoke is, is burned in that lower chamber. I don't know if you can see that on, on the right. Uh, so the, um, the, the, the top chamber is where the wood burns, but then there's a downdraft and all the smoke is burned in the lower chamber. So I'm able to heat my 800 square foot shop and my uh, uh, 500 square foot um, little house on about five or six pieces of wood per day because you're approaching 100% uh, efficiency. So um, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, the, the new Gnosticism that we're facing is a, a, a big part of our um, uh, estrangement from the material world. We expect to be able to walk into um, uh, to a room and just magically press a button and be comfortable, be warm. Uh, be cool in the summer. Uh, we expect um, food to kind of magically appear on our plates without giving much thought to where it came from. Uh, and these are part of the problem. And instead of being a scold and a bummer outer, I think um, if we gave more attention to home, um, it's just a better way to go. So uh, I'll stop there and I look forward to your questions. Or if not any questions, then uh, you know, 15 minutes of full-throated applause would be fine too. So, oh, thanks, Robert. And I got the hands, I got the hands clap from from Robert. So happy to answer questions about you know the theology is what I know more about. Um, my dad would be the first to tell you how little I really know about home construction, but I'm happy to talk about that too. Love talking about furniture making and surrounding ourselves with beautiful uh, objects that are, are are made locally and made to last. Uh, but welcome any any responses, um, even I'll physical start ones. Start with an easy one, please. Uh, what was the name of the uh, material that you used for the walls again? Uh, Sips, Sips panels, structural insulated panels, and they've been around for a long time. Uh, it's 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 inefficient to use them on a stick built house because you're building the frame twice. If you if you just build uh, you know with um, the timber frame, it's it's the perfect uh, to way to go because the 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 sips all they have to do is hold up the siding and the drywall whatever you, whatever you put on the interior it doesn't have to to bear any load so even though it's called a structural panel it doesn't have to be and you can put them on roofs too uh, which is where you know, a lot of the heat heat loss happens I happen not to but one one could.
It's are a, your it's step a, panels inside the framing or are they outside the framing? Uh, these are outside because I wanted to be able to see the actual frame. Uh, you can also do infill uh, where you use the cavity created by the timbers and then there's a variety of ways that you can frame around that, but then you don't see the pretty joinery, which is kind of right. the, the right. whole point. And with the ceiling, I really wanted the beams to stay exposed, which means insulating on top of them because you know you want to see the rafter. Usually in a stick built house, you would use the rafter as you know the cavity that you fill with insulation, but then you hide it. So that's why the insulation is on top in mine. Yeah. Well, I hope your stools are holding up well over at Wally's. Those are beautiful. Thank you. They are. Uh, my wife has, has been mad that I made those for the college. And uh, pres <laughs> President and uh, First Lady Feller got some stools a couple years ago. And I guess my wife has been pretty jealous of those. So she's getting three for Christmas. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> I'm glad they haven't walked off either. I was tempted to take one. They're beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> This is being recorded, Eric, so uh, we'll know. I know. I'll, where, I'll leave them there. Go. I'll leave them there. Hopefully, they'll make it to the new uh, whatever replaces the Sparks Center yeah, when that comes along. Son of Sparks. Yeah. I have well, high it's hopes. It's interesting you talk about the philosophy, and that's, you know, there is within architecture um, lead, you know, which mm -hmm. is trying to encourage people um, to, to take the next step and to be innovative and sustainability. And um, mm -hmm. it's, I don't know, not working as well as I think I had hoped it would. Mm -hmm. um, but it is always interesting as an architect to approach a project and, and take some of that same philosophy about, you know, let's, let's make this uh, a sustainable project so it doesn't just serve, you know, the immediate needs, but that it'll be flexible enough that it can serve whatever needs follow those yeah a, um, have you read um uh how buildings learn um no I, I i know of it but i haven't read it it's an interesting it's an interesting read and it in a different way i think espouses kind of the the same philosophy where there's some buildings that were meant to be very permanent and turn out not to be because they weren't flexible in a lot of ways and then buildings that were meant to be temporary that have lasted for hundreds of years because it turns out they were easy to adapt to new uses yeah, and yeah. well built to begin with. Yeah, it's very interesting. I, I think, you know, part of my interest here became when someone said, well, the, the next thing in environmental home design is 3D printing your house. And I was just like, that is not, <laughs> you know, even if the, the mass outcome, production, right? So exactly, that's part of the, right. We're just sidestepping the issue. Like, I should just be able to, like, snap my fingers and then have my house like that's that's the fact that i expect that is precisely the problem and right. so just doing it more is not going to solve it right so there's a lot of national homes still standing out there there are and actually yeah. you know from a lot of them there's some aspects of it that they are sustainable because you can still reach up to clean the gutters out and you know it's you've got a an attic that you can rewire and and there's a lot of elements about those that um, they're simple. You know, they are they are relatively simple, yeah. but um, not necessarily beautiful. I think part of the problem, and you put your finger on, it, is the the human size of them uh, that they aren't so massive uh, that you can't afford to maintain them. Places right. uh, one of the cities that's been the most in, innovative in in ecological home design is Vancouver. Um, not just because of its population, but because it's surrounded on three sides by mountains and on one by the ocean, which means that you really have to be creative about how you're going to use the space. You can't just have a 8,000 square foot rambler that you spend so much money building, you have to put the crappiest vinyl, you know, fossil <laughs> right. fuel, everything in this entire, you know. And so you're always trading quality for, for cost. Quantity, quantity, okay. yeah. And so those small starter homes, uh, you know, we need more of those. And there's a, this whole thing about ADUs and, you know, I'm not pretending to have any of the kind of the policy expertise. I just want to start a conversation about, about beauty and, and loving your, and loving your dwelling, loving your home. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's a learning experience yourself to go through the construction process and, and to understand how you need to put everything together. And to, it, it's, it's a fascinating Having spent three years remodeling a guest bathroom in my house, just 
<laughs> based on weekend available time and learning how to tile walls and how to put a shower together. It was really fun. I mean, I, I think the DIY is a, is a kind of, um, uh, what's the word um, pushback against mm -hmm. this commercialized uh, um, um, trends that I'm kind of lamenting. I, I think it's great. Mm -hmm. Try to do it yourself. The tiny house mm -hmm. is a little bit crunchy for me, but uh, that's why I wanted mine to be 500. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Other uh, questions from folks? Well, Professor Nelson, thanks. That was a very interesting presentation. And uh, uh, Seeing, you know, the great detail you went to to build the um, home there, at the same time, a question crossed my mind. Um, if you were to extend that to large masses uh, to build that style of uh, structure, mm -hmm. um, has there been any research or... Um, any look at the volume of wood materials or um, quality materials that meet the standards that you tried to go by there yeah. to do large scale mass construction for the uh, amount of population we have mm -hmm. uh, in this country and others. Seems yeah. to me like we, we might be stretching the bounds of available material to, to utilize. There's quite a bit less wood in a timber frame than there is in a conventional stick built frame because uh, a stick built frame is is uh, inherently redundant. Uh, you put far more studs in than you need because uh, when they were um, originally built, they weren't built by skilled people who knew exactly you know how to specify and how to set. So you can have lots of studs fail and the wall will still be up. So it's 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 overbuilt in the sense that it's a intentionally redundant system. Um, you know, if you're talking about actual um, energy costs, you know, it's far lower in a kind of insulated, uh, necessarily smaller uh, structure like the one that, that I built. So I wouldn't want to single out only uh, lumber availability. Um, to answer your question, though, specifically about, you know, do we have enough eight by eight um, beams for, for enough houses to, to build uh, like this, uh, the question is, al it's almost certainly yes. Uh, almost any kind of um, uh, wood can um, be used. And in fact, most of human history has been, been built with post and beam and, and timber frames. I mean, that until 1840, mo um, most structures in the United States were built that way. It wasn't until we really started to move west uh, that we needed to, to do it differently. So uh, there probably is uh, what what we don't have anywhere near of is the skills. That's the that's the real bottleneck. Is um, you know it it takes. This was my first one ever, and it turned out great. But I have a pretty extensive experience in woodworking, and I've roofed houses for years. My dad's a carpenter. Uh, you know, I called him pretty often to complain about this. Uh, I've been reading about it for a while, uh, but you know, we just don't have the people who know how to do it. So that's actually kind of one of my dreams. I'm a pastor uh, and, you know, I like it when a single ministry solution solves multiple problems. Uh, problems that face the church are um, uh, generations don't know each other. Uh, younger people are finding the church irrelevant to their kind of everyday needs. They want it to be more involved in the issues that are important to them and they don't see it. Um, and a lot of other sol problems get solved if you have this solution. Old timers teach college graduates to build their house. It, it, okay, I know that's a stretch. If that were to happen, instead of, uh, you know, okay, let's get you a good quarter million dollars of debt so you can buy you know, your house. Um, in, instead, you have, you know, hands-on learning across the generations, knowledge being passed down. Um, you, you make some compromises on size, but you, you pick up for that in beauty. And, you know, this whole thing I plan to take down and move to uh, to the Pacific Northwest where my wife is from uh, and 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 re-erect it. You just pound the pegs out, take the the unlag the the sips and you can you can do this three or four times. Uh, I don't know. I just think that would be uh, uh, an awesome thing if we could do some of that. Maybe I'm just uh, maybe I'm just dreaming, though. 
So good question, Brad. There's a, there's a, a million, um, a million problems. I haven't even mentioned really codes. Uh, you know, people don't know how to inspect these because the codes are written for stick built. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a huge, there's a lot of problems. It also seems to me that um, the mobility of our society and others and uh, it creates a demand for the volume of individual single dwellings. I traveled very limited amount outside of the U.S. Um, and uh, by example, when I was in Israel one year, the guide was telling us that it's very common for the homes there for the family extension just to go up. They add another section uh, for the next family, the son who's going to marry. They build another dwelling up on top of the existing house, so they keep these uh, generationally extended families together yeah. uh, in the same, essentially the same physical dwelling without adding another unique footprint uh, for a separate yeah. home. You know, there are, there are a whole bunch of moral issues that don't get talked about that are embedded in things like the building codes and, and zoning and how difficult it is to get something that's zoned for individual family dwellings that have to have a certain lot size and, and forbids, you know, multi-use um, the way, you know, most of Europe is sort of, you know, retail on the front lower, lower level and, and mixed, uh, you know, dwellings above. So, so we've kind of got a cookie cutter mentality uh, that I don't think is going to serve us as, as our needs change. I want to uh, answer Robert's question in the chat. Uh, yeah. EO Wilson is uh uh, yeah, I, I don't share any of his theological views at all, uh, but I think this is a beautiful point about um, th there's just something about, um, and I call it glory. I, I mean, I think it really is. Uh, I have a fountain pen that I feel so dumb writing my laundry list or my, my uh, you know, my, my grocery list with it because it feels so beautiful. Uh, and we don't normally take delight in those kinds of things. Late modern capitalism has told us that What's important about things is how they make us feel about us, not how they feel. And I, I trust the body and I trust uh, our sense of touch and our loves. Uh, and what we're drawn to is life and abundance. And I love that from from E.O. Wilson. And so that's why, you know, the 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 um, the sculpted out chairs and uh, stools and wallways that fit your butt just right it's a glorious thing uh it takes a lot of work but there's just something there's something about that that just makes you kind of want to uh reach out and grab sam maloof who's kind of a every american woodworker's hero said that that the the, the proper finish on a on a piece of furniture makes you just want to go you know kind of it's creepy when i go to my camera but just that that reach out and touch so i love that from from eo wilson I want to honor everyone's time, but we do have a minute left if someone else has a question. And I'm happy to take email questions and continue the conversation elsewhere, but. I'll add a quick comment. I was thinking during this presentation, your use of your students in class to build this home, uh, connecting the students to a home brought me back to uh, Wabash in 19, uh 76 or thereabouts uh, don baker english department we studied uh, shakespeare um, hamlet an entire semester and we had all of our class meetings of about four individuals in uh, dr baker's home living room oh, cool. so it, it was a great place to yeah. to uh, have classes and his wife brought us cookies and brownies so it was even better. <laughs> awesome yeah, it was really fun to work with those students on the on the Thoreau cabin. We talked a lot about their dreams and, and their concerns. And uh, also, honestly, how few of them had any kind of experience uh, with basic tools. Uh, almost none of them had ever held a screwdriver before. The one guy who said he had a lot of construction uh, experiences from Vietnam and what he knows is lashing bamboo, uh, <laughs> which is perfectly cool, but doesn't help you a lot with a two by four. Um, a couple of them have had their fathers die. Uh, and so they felt really a loss of not having that kind of generational knowledge passed down. And so um, another great book, I'll maybe end on this recommendation, uh, Shop Class as Soul Craft, a wonderful book by a philosopher from the University of Chicago who uh, didn't like academia. And so he uh, ended up working as a motorcycle mechanic. And he wonders about why this is so satisfying and and how alienating the, you know, you take apart a, a computer and like, what the hell is all this stuff? And I, I can't do anything with this. And he talks about, I was just at the airport uh, and I had this experience. I, I, I want to wash my hands and I, I wave them in this impotent rage below some sensor that won't turn on the damn faucet. And it's like, 
what is this mysterious world with you know but you know take a part of a motorcycle carburetor it's like eight things you know and you just adjust it and you fix it and it's, it's a it's an empowering uh way to fight against uh, the new gnosticism so there is hope i'll end with the uh, with the hopeful note of shop class thanks for joining uh, us thank you so much dr nelson we really appreciate it sure. everyone take care thank you